Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Steph, what's going on? What's going on? Nothing much, nothing much. Um, I actually woke up today on a Monday to some really good news. Okay. I had an email in my inbox that said that my IRB was approved. Hey. <laughs> I, I was like, I was really surprised because, you know, I mentioned, we mentioned the IRB before how, you know, they review our research to make sure we're not going to do anything crazy to people. Mm -hmm. And they had sent me back so many clarifications. I was so frustrated that like what should have taken me like a day or two to revise. I was just frustrated for two weeks. So I didn't (laughs) didn't resubmit it for like two. It took took me like two weeks to do it because I was just like mentally. I was kind of just frustrated and devastated. Yeah, like I'm putting this to the side. I ain't trying to deal with it right now. Yeah, I just didn't feel like dealing with it. And I resubmitted it Friday, and I guess because they knew I wanted to start research in August, she, you know, expedited some things, and it's approved. Yeah, hey, yeah. That's what's, that's what's up. That's a big day. <laughs> so now you get that data, then you start that writing, then you get that degree, and you out of there. <laughs> yeah, so, like, right now, folks, the only thing that's holding me back from this degree is me. Yeah, I got a yeah. committee that got to review things, but I got to get the work done before they can even do that. So it's on me, y'all. Keep me yep. accountable. Keep her accountable. We'll make sure she'll get it and get that PhD for BHD. <laughs> Yay, PhD for BHD. Yeah. What's uh, up with you? Sure. Not and just getting back in town. Uh was away in, in Georgia, in Atlanta, and Augusta, celebrating the nuptials of Jamel and Sarah. Shout out to you all. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Yes, yeah, so it was a real nice. I know it's real- probably hot down there. Oh, it was. It was. But good thing. The only thing was outside was a ceremony. We was out there for just like 30 minutes. So it wasn't too bad. Then we got inside. And, um, you know, it was a beautiful wedding. Got to hang out with some of the homies and, and and all these other married couples, which is nice. You know, this this phase of our lives now. So shout out to the to the in-laws, too, with their great Southern hospitality. Keeping, keeping the brother well fed when we was out there. <laughs> yes, the South will do that. Yes. We, we like to treat folk. Oh, sure did you did. have some sweet tea? I didn't have... sweet tea, not that northern tea that you got to put your own uh, sugar in, but sweet tea. No, no, I didn't have any sweet tea. Wasn't drinking any sweet tea, but definitely had some good amount of beers out there and chilling. <laughs> Uh, so it was a good time, man. It was a good getaway. Now I'm like, you know, you get back from a little vacation and you still got to like, rest after the vacation, you know, to relax a little bit more at home before you start getting back into work and all that stuff. Yeah. Whenever I have a vacation, I try to come back at least to give myself at least one day of rest between uh-huh. when I need to work and, you know, when I just got back. Because, yep. yeah. Just to readjust back to mm-hmm. normal lifestyle. <laughs> All right. So, listen, you got some old Lord news for us, Dad? I do. Of All course right. I do. Right. Let's get into it. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye opening old Lord news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say. Okay, so like you just mentioned, you know, everybody has been on holiday because last week was the 4th of July for those who celebrated, even if, if, even if they weren't celebrating the actual holiday, you know, it's a cookout day. Mm-hmm. People love to eat. Mm-hmm. And so there were a lot of potlucks, you know, people bring the potato salad and all that good stuff. Well, look, 
y'all, there are going to be plenty more cookouts for the rest of the summer, but y'all need to be careful. In Charlotte, you know, there was some type of potluck party and, you know, everybody ate. And then next thing you know, everybody went home and 33 people had to be transported to the hospital. One person even went to the intensive care unit because they all transmitted some type of bacteria from the food that can guess what? Only be transmitted through exposure to feces. Oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> oh that's crazy. That's nasty. Yo. That is so nasty. 33 people with people going into the ICU. And so it's just like people be careful because not everybody wash their hands when they cook. Some people don't even wash their food. Like you be careful out here in these cookout Son, streets. What in the world? So some nasty person ain't washed their hands and had their hands up in the food. <laughs> got all these people sick. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that's nasty, uh, man. <laughs> that is nasty. You know how people take uh, food home from the cookout? So, mm-hmm. like, the health the health director, like, put out, like, an announcement. Like, if you took any food home from the cookout, don't eat oh, it. Away. It must have been in a, in a particular dish because if everybody didn't get sick, it must have been something like a side I dish know, or something. But- but it's crazy, 33 people. It was a very popular dish. Yeah. Oh, that's nasty. Okay. <laughs> that's nasty. <laughs> uh, so be, yeah, be careful, y'all. If y'all going to public cookouts and stuff, who preparing that food, man? Because that's nasty. You just don't know, honey. Mm-hmm. Uh, eat before you go. Yeah, pretty How much. That? That's always a safe bet. Uh, so speaking of, like, enjoying the holidays. So this is a wild black story. Mm. So on the 4th, There was a mother who decided that she wanted to take her child for a dip in the community pool. Well, when she gets there, of course, there are a lot of people there. But for some reason, this guy, who is now known as Pool Patrol Paul, came up to her, (laughs) another one, came up to her and demanded to know her address Mm-hmm. He wanted to see her ID. Mm. And, you know, she's like, well, first of all, she, I don't know why she did this because I sure wouldn't have. Mm-hmm. But she told him her address. But, you know, she went to the pool. She didn't have her ID on her. So it's a pool for her particular neighborhood. So, yeah, you, she probably didn't show up with ID. And so when he when she wouldn't show him ID, he just kept harassing her. And so, you know, of course, he called the police. Mm-mm-mm. Yes. <sighs> And um, and so, like, the police, they diffused the situation. I think the only thing that bothered me about the police is that this guy did not back down. Even in front of the police, he was like, you know, if she'll just show me some ID, if she'll just show me this, if she'll just show me that. And she's explaining, like, I don't have to show you anything. And what pissed me off is that the police kind of, in, you know, they were like, cordial and nice or whatever they weren't attacking the the black lady but they indulged him by saying like ma'am can i see if your key card works just to like ease his suspicion but he knew it worked because she couldn't get in the pool without like swiping Mm. in and then on the video you see all of these white people walking into the pool it actually when they swipe the black woman's card like some white people walked in under that swipe (laughs) you know they're not getting stopped they're not being asked anything and it's just kind of like for real that's crazy man Pool Patrol Paul add another one to the to the anything wild black hall of fame man that's crazy yeah <laughs> people are actually like creating collector cards I, saw, I so think like, I saw that <laughs> and you know what and I, I saw the Pool Patrol Paul I'm like what is this I didn't I didn't know about this one you know, I saw the barbecue Becky yes. and um, the other one with the girl selling water and all this other stuff yeah I can't think of her name <laughs> yeah. now but oh god oh my god man that's crazy a permit patty. But it don't even order. Yeah, permit mm-hmm. patty. It don't even stop in the realm of just enjoying your life. Actually in Oregon, there was a state representative who's uh I think she's running for re-election. And of course, we want our legislators, we want these people who are supposed to be representing us to come talk to us. Well, she was canvassing the neighborhoods that she serves mm-hmm. and Somebody called the police. Goodness, so. bruh. <laughs> bruh, these people got the police on speed dial for anything. It's insane. 
Yes. And so the thing is, she was she was, of course, I mean, she has to be very diplomatic about it. She's running for office. And she said the sheriff was really nice. You know, uh, the sheriff called the lady and was like, "Okay, this lady is running for office, you know. And so, of course, a legislator, a black legislator, she was just pretty much like, I wish you had just spoken to me. Just talk to me if you're afraid. You know, I'm because I think the what bothered the lady is that, like, after the lady would leave a house, uh, the legislator would leave her house. She would go and she would like take notes mm-hmm. of the conversation. Yeah. But the lady told the police that she was like casing oh the joint, goodness, like oh, taking. Man. Yeah, that's great. Like I mean, what what? Why does everything scare these folks so much? Like true danger does not look like that. Somebody knocking on people's doors. Yeah. Like if you're doing something bad and wrong, you're not like knocking on a door and then going to the next door and then going to the next door. If anything, I'm thinking this person about to try to sell me something. You know, one of those type situations. You trying to hide out? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not here. Yes. I'm not thinking like, yo, this person trying to look in my house and rob me. Like what? Come on, that's crazy. <sighs> Yeah. Oh, that's definitely going Okay, so our our last story, I just have to say this because this makes me really sad as an educator. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was a lawsuit that was filed back in 2016 in Detroit uh, by some families who uh, were fighting to get just a minimum basic adequate education. And so, you know, they pretty much argued that they were not being given, uh, that their 14th Amendment rights were being violated because they were being denied access to literacy on account of their Mm. race. Um, And that's because of the schools that they are uh, required to attend, you know, because of, uh, you know, boundary zones and just um, things of that nature. And so the... The verdict on that came back this past week, um, and the judge said literacy is of incalculable performance. However, for literacy to be considered a fundamental right, there would have to be evidence that neither liberty nor justice would exist absent state-provided literacy access. The conditions and outcomes of the plaintiff schools are nothing short of devastating. When a child who could be taught to read goes untaught, the child suffers a lasting injury and so does society. Mm -hmm. But the court is faced with a discreet question. Does the due process clause demand that a state affirmatively provide each child with a defined minimum level of education by which the child can attain literacy? Based on the forego analysis, the answer to that question is no. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, like, pretty much they they do not see this as a fundamental right. Oh and although God. they say it's important to society, I don't know. I, I They said they had to see evidence that liberty nor justice would exist absent um, state-provided literacy access. But how can we have liberty or justice without education, without Mm -hmm. literacy. Like you are making it so that people aren't able to exercise their liberties and aren't able to fight for justice if they can't even comprehend Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. basic. Basic rights. Like you said, this this can, like they said in the statement, this can be an injury that, you know, you have for the rest of your life if you think of it in that way, you know, if you're not given the proper basics of being able to understand and interpret these liberties and and justice. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the Supreme, you said that went up to the Supreme court. Uh, mm, I think it went to the Massachusetts or no, it was the Eastern district of Michigan. So maybe it might go higher. That doesn't seem like the Supreme, uh, Michigan Supreme court. Yeah. Yeah, They'll they'll probably take that up to the, to the higher courts and, and try to get that overturned. Hopefully, yeah. That just got to be it. That's just a basic right. So I think there could be a case there. Anyway. But that's how it works, too. We usually start with the lower courts and then you work your way up. So we'll keep our eye on that case for sure and see what comes of it in the near future. But you see how they're they trying, they trying to keep us illiterate, y'all. They mm-hmm. don't want us to know because mm-hmm. what we say, that, that knowledge is power, mm-hmm. that that's BHD. The most. Yes, uh-huh. that's what they fear the most. Fear and the look most. at them. Oh, trying to use the courts to take away our rights. Yep, that, that can't last. We won't let that last. We'll keep. We'll keep on that. Keep bringing attention to that for sure. 
Yeah. Uh, but it, it actually makes me think of everything that's going on now and even the topic of today's conversation. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking about the courts and, you know, your boy about to make that announcement. Mm-hmm. You're about to point somebody else to the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court justice. Lord, have mercy. In the hands of Donald J. Trump. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, we think about these decisions that these judges are going to make to say what our rights are. And like I said, it makes me think about today's conversation, which is about politics. It's about not just politics, but what they call reactionary conservatism Mm -hmm. and what some people would like to see happen, which is to take us back to a time that they see as great, but that minorities see as like one of the worst times in our history. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's one of the times where like, you know, they wanted to do literacy tests when they weren't teaching black folk how to read, but do literacy tests to be able to vote and things like that. Like, Mm -hmm. is is that the America we want again? That is not the America we want or I want. Hopefully none of us want. And so this is why we went. We definitely took the time out to to talk to somebody about this topic. We talked to Dr. Christopher Parker, who co-wrote a book mm-hmm. with Matt Barreto. The book is called Change yes. They Can't Believe in, The Tea Party and Reactionary Politics in America, where they use really, yes. really good research to highlight and explain pretty much who voted for Trump, why they voted for Trump, what it looks like, and where does that kind of leave us in this area, just the development of this Tea Party era and politics. Um, of course, this book came mm-hmm. out before Trump was elected, but it explains to us the, his, his constituents, right, how somebody like Trump came to power and gained so much support and how strategic these particular people were in this situation and offers great insights as what we could and should do and need to pay attention to in this next upcoming election to make sure we do not get duped again and have to relive this experience for another four years because I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, um, I, I don't know either, but yeah, it was crazy that they had the forethought to like do this book. Like when Ty says like a well-researched book, like this is top quality research is one of the best books, research books I've ever mm-hmm. read. Um, and this conversation is real. Yes. It's real, raw and uncut. <laughs> and we kept, we kept it real. No, we haven't edited, you know, as far as content with with any of our um, guests. We want everybody to be authentic. They're authentic, authentic selves. And Dr. Parker was that. And so by saying that was a really great, passionate conversation, really great content. But we do want to preface and let you know this conversation is for adults only. (laughs) So if you're listening with children around and all that kind of stuff, you know, you might want to just be more careful for this particular episode uh, because we kept it. We kept it all the way real in this particular conversation because, you know. And it has some language. Yeah. Yeah, because talking about Trump will will do that to you. You It will. It'll make you drop some all types of (laughs) F-bombs, F-bombs, like everything. Talking about Trump will definitely bring that out of of all of us. So so we just want to preface that for those of you listening and may have children around or whatever. Uh, But definitely listen regardless because there, there is a lot of great content in this conversation and it was a really good interview. Um, yeah, so, one of the best interviews we've done, hands down. You want to listen? Oh yeah, yeah. We appreciate Dr. Parker taking out. He was a very, very busy person, doing a lot of great work, and always means a lot when all our guests can take the time out and chat with us for you all and shed this this knowledge and, and hopefully create some change or continue this conversation. So, with that being said, we're ready to get right into it. And um, you know, we know you guys will enjoy the conversation, so we'll catch up with y'all afterwards. Right. Peace out. <laughs> Over the past 10 years, the United States has seen a rise in a new brand of conservatism focused on making America great again, a slogan which harkens back to a time that was only great for straight, white, Christian men. Today, we examine the factors that have contributed to the rise in reactionary politics by interviewing Dr. Christopher Parker, a professor of political science and co-author of Change They Can't Believe In, the Tea Party and Reactionary Politics in America. Specifically, we discuss the roles of race, religion, and social dominance orientation in the rise of reactionary conservatism, the Tea Party's playbook, and the future of the progressive political movement. Today, we welcome Dr. Parker. Uh, 
Okay, so today we are here with Dr. Christopher Parker. Uh, we are really excited to have a conversation about yes, politics uh, in the age of Trump. Oh my goodness. So we usually begin these conversations by having our guests to tell us a little bit more about who they are. So who are you, Dr. Parker, and how did you become interested in political science and politics? So first of all, well, thank you for the invitation. I was really surprised and, and really thrilled to get it, especially when you said you read the work in Larry's class. because Larry is, I mean, that dude is like legendary. So I was really flattered. Um, beyond that, oh, and also I have a small request. Please don't call me Dr. Parker. You know, I don't wear a lab coat. I ain't taking appointments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Call me the Professor Parker or Chris. I, I really don't care. Okay. Um, so, I, you know what's... Thank you for asking. So I got in, I was initially interested in studying politics uh, like I have, I'm afraid like a lot of other undergraduates uh, because I thought about going to law school at first. And I started off in international relations because prior to going to school, I went to undergrad at UCLA. Prior to doing that, I was in, a, in the Navy for five years. And so I specialized in IR because I wanted to understand some of the uh, global and strategic reasons why we were in certain places of the world, you know, when I was on board these ships. Um, and then, um, so I went to University of Chicago with the idea that I was going to study IR. But then I took one of Michael Dawson's classes, you know, who used to be at Harvard, who's now back at the University of Chicago, who was my advisor. He teaches black politics. Um, he's like the top person as far as I know. And, um, and it just kind of really twisted me, right? But it was two things. One, you know, I got tired of the old sort of realist questions, you know, versus uh, versus neoliberal questions. You know, is it about the, you know, the security dilemma or is it about international institutions? And I just kind of got tired of that. And then just take it to my Michael's classes and just say, I, I, I got really work I need to do over here because, you know, I just thought it a lot more interesting because I thought the questions were more interesting to ask over there. So that's how I got into political science. And then um, I, I took the uh, uh, LSAT. I did okay in the LSAT, but I didn't have an intrinsic love for the law. I mean, I quite frankly did not want to go and work for some, you know, I think they call them white shoe law firms, right? And and even if I went to Harvard or Yale, you know, and still, you know, I'd just be, I'm just going to go here. I'd, I'd just be another nigga with a Harvard or Yale law degree. I would never get in the club, right? <laughs> so, and then I, and then there was a secondary consideration. Actually, this is probably primary. Let me back up. But there was another consideration rather. And any time, and my kids were very small at the time. My, my daughters were like two and five, respectively. And so uh, anytime I went to go try to find help, go to office hours to try to find one of my professors, I couldn't find them. I mean, they were always at a conference or somewhere off campus. And I started thinking, it's like, well, I got two little kids. I want a whole lot of free time. I can never find these guys. Maybe this is what I need to do. So and so and so that's how I really started thinking about the Ph.D. a lot more seriously. And then the final point is I had one of my professors as an undergrad had both a law degree and a Ph.D. And I asked him, I was like, well, you know, what do you think? He was like, well, you see what I'm doing now. Right. I'm not practicing law anymore. And that was pretty much about it. So I went to the Ph.D. program at the University of Chicago and I finished up, got my first academic job at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I did a two-year postdoc at Berkeley with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and then I came here, University of Washington, in 2006, and I've been here ever since. Awesome. Awesome. So moving forward, in your book, um, that that is the focal point in this conversation, is some of the content from it that you co-wrote, Change, that, Change They Can't Believe In, you focus on reaction, reactionary conservatism. Mm -hmm. um, so for our listeners, can you at least talk about the differences between traditional conservatives and reactionary? Yeah, that's a very good question. And that was one of the things that uh, we wanted pe people to pick up on. Uh, so one of the things, one of the goals of the book, uh, beyond calling bullshit on the Tea Party, um, just to try to, you know, try to show them for who we thought they really were, and that's who they really were, was, you know, for more establishment conservatives to, you know, to try to take some intellectual cover behind our argument. And by that, we I mean that so think about what uh, an establishment conservative wants. So think about one of the things, you know, so if you think about the establishment conservatives, most people would agree that it began with Edmund Burke. And what Edmund Burke, what he's mainly known for his treatise on the French Revolution, was about the ancient regime should have conceded more, because if they conceded more, then you wouldn't have this revolutionary change. 
And so and so and so one of the things that an establishment conservative wants, you know, according to like Russell Kirk and all these other people that have written on conservatism over the years, is that they want stability. They want they want order. They want stability. Right. Um, yes. You know, they, they believe in hierarchy, but but they believe that that leads to stability and they really believe in rule of law. Right. And if, if and if nothing else, if we sort of think about this, how what would this look like? They don't really they really support the status quo. They are all about the status quo, because when you think about, you know, the etymological derivation or the meaning of conserve conservatism or conservatives. Right. Is to conserve. Right. So by definition, they have a strong preference for the status quo. The only time that they will they will sort of agree to change is this change is is it if, if it's uh, slow, incremental, organic. Right. So they want to avoid revolutionary change at all times. Like I said, their primary, uh, their primary uh, occupation, not, not primary occupation, their primary predisposition is for stability. So if they have to give a little bit in order to avoid revolutionary change in terms of social progress, then that's what they'll do, right? And so one way to differentiate an establishment conservative from a reactionary type is an establishment conservative they will they will support change so long as it's slow and incremental and it's productive. A reactionary doesn't want change at all. A reactionary actually wants to go backwards in time. It is not about the preservation of the status quo. It's about going backwards in time. Another thing is a reactionary is not all about the rule of law. As we saw during the during the height of the Tea Party, you know, you had a lot. I mean, you think about what happened during the during during the hearings for the Affordable Care Act. You had all these Tea Party folks out there that are spitting on lawmakers, yelling at them. You had Sarah Palin um, who put crosshairs on the on the uh, headquarters of districts, right? That had Republicans who supported the American, uh, uh, the, excuse me, ACA, right? Affordability Affordability Care Act, American Affordability Care Act, right? And so and so and then you also had some. I mean, you had people with AK forty sevens and. You know, I mean, it was like they didn't care about violence or or the possibility of sowing violence at all, which is not what a real conservative would want. And another thing between a real conservative and establishment conservative and a reactionary is the way that they look at politics. So an establishment conservative is is more of a pragmatist. They're OK with making compromise. Right. They're fine with making compromise. You know why? Because they see the differences between them and the and Democrats as just political differences, they're they're their opponents, right? But for a reactionary, this is about this Manichaean worldview of good versus evil, right? So they can't compromise because to do so is to capitulate to evil, right? So that's so those are these real big differences between reactionaries and establishment conservatives. Mm, um, that was really informative. And, you know, what you said, it actually made me think of a quote from your book that just like stuck out for me. And I've, I cannot forget this. You, you all say the reactionary conservative doesn't just doesn't want to stop at the prevention of change. He prefers to reverse whatever progress has been made at this point. And that's frightening. That is frightening. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. You think about the Tea Party. You know, they actually wanted to go backwards in time. I mean, think about their slogan, take our country back. Well, backwards in time or from whom, it really doesn't matter. They are functionally equivalent terms, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you think about Donald Trump, make America great again. Like, what's so fucked up about America now? Oh, that's right. There's more diversity, right? <laughs> There's, you know, you know, you know, women, you know, uh, women have women are more prominent in American society. The recognition of same sex rights, right? Um, you know, so you have all these things that are, quote unquote, different. Right. As far as these people are concerned. And if you think about take America back, you know, it, it suggests that, you know, the real Americans, the quote unquote, real Americans are under siege of some kind. And yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you can't check if so if you're not a white male, middle class or better off uh, uh, Christian, straight and native born, if you can't check all those boxes, guess what? You're not a real American. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So um, in thinking about reactionary politics in general, what has contributed to the rise of this new wave of reactionary conservatism? Well, so if you think about it historically, right, it's, it's all about, 
you know, rapid, the threat of rapid social change. We go back to the Know Nothing Party, you know, of the of the 1850s, right? So they were concerned mainly about Irish and Catholic immigrants. So if you think about, furthermore, you think about the Klan of the 1920s, not the Klan of the 19th century that came, that that emerged after the Civil War. I'm not talking about that Klan because that was a regional reactionary movement. We mainly addressed and stressed um, national reactionary movements. And so in that context, um, you have to think about the Klan of the 1920s. The Klan of the 1920s was a national right-wing movement. They, they were, they, you know, you could find them in New York, you could find them clear across the country, all the way over to Washington State, where I live. And of course, they remained in the South. They were founded in 1915 Stone Mountain, Georgia. Um, and this clan, um, you know, they were reacting to the quote unquote return, excuse me, the return of the quote unquote new Negro, right? So you had this new Negro movement, if you will, that would no longer brook accommodation, right? And, and much of this was inspired by participation in and the values over which World War II was fought. Um, and then you had, you know, this fear and concern about, you know, the, you know, this perception of Jewish uh, dominance over capital. Um, you know, you had this concern with, again, with Catholic immigrants um, and having the Pope run American politics from the Vatican. Um, you And you also had this, this concern about white men, you know, policing the bodies of white women, you know, vis-a-vis black men. So you had all of these things happening. And so the Klan was just freaked out. Right. And so and so, yeah, so you get the rise of the Klan of the 1920s. Um, and then you get and then you get the, the John Birch Society in the 1950s, right? Early ni- mid 1950s, early 1960s. You know, these people were so I mean, so they were concerned about retaining American hegemony in the international system. Right. But they thought America hegemony was being undermined from within through the civil rights movement. And this perception that the civil rights movement was in cahoots with the Soviet Union. Right. And so you had that. So you had this paranoia associated that with that. Then you have the Tea Party paranoia with Obama. And now you have Trump. Now, what what knits all of these movements together, you know, in spite of the time differences, um, is that they were all led by white middle class, middle age, you know, straight back then, Protestant, now Christian men. Right. That's what this was about. And so and so it's always about this change. Right. So the new Negro movement, Klan, right? And then you get you get the civil rights movement in the 1960s, late 1950s, early 1960s, John Birch Society pops up. President Obama comes on board, emerges, right, politically. You get the Tea Party, right? And so what we see right now with Trump is an extension of that Tea Party surge. This is a backlash to having a black president. So it's about this rapid social change. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, my, I, my next question is about kind of, trying to look a little bit deeper into, I guess, the demographics of this with religion in particular, um, you know, how much or does religion kind of play in a role, a role as far as the reactionary politics or the Tea Party? Because even when I look at my own personal experiences and being raised in the black church and then later on finding out recently that the church I was raised in, the pastor was a Trump supporter or and and voted conservatively and stuff like that, uh, mainly because their sole foundation was based off of religious reasons, dealing with abortion and things of that nature. So is there a connection between religion and reactionary politics and the Tea Party at all? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there is. Well, there is kind of. I mean, so on the surface level, yeah, that's that is definitely the case. The problem, however, is that when you start accounting for other things in a model that predicts support for like Trump and the Tea Party in our Tea Party book, when we looked at uh, support for Trump, there is like no impact that religion plays on support for for the Tea Party. Same thing in our models for in support for Trump. It just it, it okay. has no bearing on it. And, and, and it's likely because the impact of religiosity and support on Trump is mediated by any number of things. It could be racism, right? It could be more traditionalism. It could be authoritarianism. Anyway, when you fully specify these models, right, then the impact on religiosity, on support for these right-wing movements, it completely goes away. And what that means in a practical sense is it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if you're religious or not, right, that you still get these white people that support these movements. Mm, okay. 
So I guess in thinking about that, you, uh, you kind of, for our audience, you talked about your model and yeah. like the di- different like variables that you looked into to see what drove support, you know, for the Tea Party and, you know, these reactionary politics and policies. And one in particular that I wanted to talk about is social dominance or social dominance orientation. And I was wondering if you could provide the audience a little bit of insight into that concept and and how it has contributed, you know, to support for the Tea Party and reactionary politics. Yeah, so social dominance, it plays a role, played a role in support for the Tea Party. It also plays a role in um, support for Trump as well. And let me tell you, there's a couple of reasons why we included social dominance. One, it doesn't get a whole lot of play in political science. And, you know, since Jim is black and he's a political psychologist, like I've known Jim and Larry since I was an undergrad, right? And so... And so, and their work is excellent. And I just got tired of it um, being ignored in political science. So I'm like, we're putting this in the model. So, so it's like no ifs, ands, or buts. That's another political statement, but it was also very important theoretically and substantively as well. Um, so with social dominance, or into, basically what social dominance is, is that it's this concept that gets at this idea of, I, I, I'm not sure if I can use all of Jim's fancy words, arbitrary, said high. Set. I forgot all. I forgot all that. Set, yeah, I right. <laughs> right. uh, right. I forgot all those concepts. But the bottom line is that there is a certain group of people, you know, who in their personality are predisposed to anti egalitarian practices, right? And and that's not confined to race. You know, that's about that's about misogyny too, right? That's about xenophobia as well. So this is not only about race. So what this means is, and so and so the way that that depart, and I had to think long and hard. I knew I wanted to put it in a model, but social dominance is such a strong predictor of everything. It's like this might just completely cook what we're trying to do here. But what gave us the the confidence to move on is once we put that in a model and our concept, you know, Tea Party support in some cases or in early chapter. Um, you know, this idea that Obama, you know, was pushing socialism, right, that it survived, let us know that we had something really tangible and real. So what social dominance says, what social dominance will say that what it will say that the more socially dominant people are, this idea that that these that these hierarchies are are natural and legitimate, um, that that the more people feel have this sense or have this sentiment or harbor this sentiment, the more likely they were to support the Tea Party and the more likely they are to support Donald Trump. So <clears throat> so in the book, uh, there was a note that, you know, or, you know, comment, whatever, about reactionary politics and the prejudices of the people who truly believe in the Tea Party ideology and saying that they're not pro- really dangerous for the democratic process in and of themselves, but they are problematic because of their potential to convert their sentiments into public policy. And we've seen this as far as with the Tea Party and these reactionary conservatives, as far as how well they organize and kind of get things into to action. So why is the reactionary right so successful in organizing efforts to roll back the change that they don't believe in? So that's a very good question, Terrell. So, um, they're so successful because, quite frankly, because they thrive on negative affect. It's about fear, anger, and anxiety. And it's mainly anger and anxiety, not fear. And because we're taught that, especially if you look at the emotional appraisal literature, um, you know, by, you know, uh, she was my Lazarus and Datcher and Keltner and all these folks, is that the response to fear is usually to withdraw in some kind of way. So, but the response to anger, right, the behavioral response to anger is typically to approach the stimulus. And that's because you feel some sense of, of indignation and violation in some kind of way. So that these people feel like their country is being taken from them, being, is being pilfered from them, being stolen from them, and they want it back and they're pissed, right? So it's more, I would say that for these Tea Partiers and Trump supporters, this is more about anger. And then there's a, the anxiety component that could bleed into anger as well, right? So the anxiety is about this idea, like, you know how it is with anxiety. You don't, one doesn't know what the outcome is going to be, right? So you're like, and so it makes you really nervous. And what you do is you try to seek out more and more information, in this case, political information, to try to resolve this anxiety. Right. And so and so this anxiety comes from this idea that the country is just changing too fast. This is no longer the America um, 
that they've grown to come in love and in which they grew up. Right. So now, you know, they're having to compete with people of color. These men, these misogynist men are having to compete, you know, with women on an equal footing. They're having to take the rights of 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 immigrants a lot more seriously now. Right. This is no longer their America. Right. And so it makes them really nervous. And so and many on many occasions, this anxiety will trickle over or chip into or transfer itself into anger. But it doesn't necessarily need to begin with anxiety. It can begin and end with anger. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, so your work and a work uh, work of other scholars suggest that reactionary conservatives, in addition to this anger, you know, they have knowledge of legislative processes and they also participate um, in voting more than others. So like more than like traditional conservatives and like, you know, people on the left wing. So I was wondering what might motivate more left-leaning or progressive constituents to become just as angry and involved? Like, could you see a similar movement on the left? Is there an equivalent to the Tea Party on the left? Well, I'm okay. I'm going to try to keep this clean because I get so worked up on this. So, this is what this is this is this is what I think. I think that is possible, but the left is not usually accustomed to working off of. Uh, negative affect. They're normally about positive affect, hope, pride, those kind of things. Unfortunately, that, that doesn't get people out and rouse people up, rile people up rather, as, as well as negative affect. Negative affect hits you in the gut, right? Positive affect, hope, pride, it hits you in the gut too, but it's not, it's not, an, it's not like an existential threat. And see, that's what drives the right so well, this sense of existential threat. So I would say that what to get the left out and to be more mobilized, right, it has to be about a sense of existential threat. This whole Bernie bro bullshit is not going to work. It is not going to. Let me repeat myself. This motherfucking Bernie bro bullshit is not going to work. Right. And especially not going to work for people of color. And I'm working on some stuff empirically right now. Right. And what we show for people on the left, hopefully we're going to publish this in a monkey cage soon and then we're going to have a more academic paper. Um, so what we show is that so what we do is we have two frames. We have one frame that that uh, for, it's an experiment that frames uh, Trump, you know, as, you know, using a Bernie bro frame. And it's about, you know, economic anxiety and economic equality. And this is what we have to do to fix this. And then we have another frame that's about existential threat. It's about threat to American, you know, American inst- democratic institutions like you know, free press, the judiciary and all that stuff. Right. And so the hypothesis is that. So what we're trying to see is like, what's going to mobilize people? What promises to mobilize people more in 2018 and 2020? And guess what happens? It's the existential threat frame frame that wins, especially among independents, the swing voters, mm. because that, because as it stands right now, there's a ceiling effect as it's associated with Democrats. Right. They're already kind of freaked out. So they are already already up there. But once you hit these independents with this frame, it really boosts them up, right? It boosts them to be at least equal to Democrats in 2018 and in 2020. This existential threat front, this Bernie bro bullshit frame does not work. And I'm not even talking about people of color, right? When I'm, let me get on that for a second. So, so I have a paper with one of our former grad students. And then I talk about this in in our new book, Matt and I's new book, um, you guys are going to like this. The Great White Hope, Donald Trump, Race, and the Crisis of American Democracy. Mm. Well, hopefully that'll be out in uh, two th- early 2020 before the general election. Nice. So one of the things... We'll yeah. have to talk to you again. <laughs> so one of the things we we'll have to follow up. And one of the things that I've been able to publish with one of my former grad students, Chris Towler, is that we hypothesized that since Trump got elected, people of color, as a general proposition see him as this existential threat that wants to roll and wants to go backwards in time, you know, that wants to, you know, make people of color second class citizens again. And so that was our main working hypothesis. And what we showed is that the more people of color, especially in the, when it comes to black folks in the South, the more they were pissed off at Trump, the more likely they were to have reported as turning out in 2016 and the more likely they say they're going to turn out in the midterms of 2018. Right. Um, and so and so and so just think about what what happened, you know, in in Alabama with Doug Jones versus versus the pedophile Roy Moore. And so what happened, the racist pedophile, as a matter of fact, 
what happened was black turnout in that election was, check this out, it was 89 percentage points. 89% of eligible blacks or blacks that were registered to vote actually voted. That's ridiculous. Uh, the highest it ever got on, under Obama's watch um, was a second term. It was 67 percentage points. Mm. So that gets at what we're talking about, this sense of existential threat. This Bernie bro bullshit is not going to work with people of color. You know why? Because I don't care how well to do one is right. One is always going to be judged on the basis of our appearance, which for us means I'm assuming both you guys are black, which for us <laughs> means our race. Yep. Right. And so that is going to be our primary identity. Let's take this to history now. Think about the last time some white man came out trying to talk about class politics and, and that we were all going to benefit. Guess who that was? It was FDR. Guess what happened? We got written the fuck out of the New Deal. That's what happened. Mm. This is not going to work. Yeah. It should work in theory, but in practice, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the left, you no. got to, there needs to be fear and anxiety, excuse me, anger and anxiety sown on the left, right? This has to be about Trump and his this sense of existential threat. That's what this has got to be about. We don't have the luxury of it being about, you know, these positive message. Oh, it's about economic uplift in the white working class. Well, you know what? The last time I checked, there were a bunch of people of color that was working class, too. Right. Y'all about to have me break into some, some ebonics around here. Y'all get me so worked up. <laughs> no. Everything you're saying is it's so real. And even from a personal perspective, I just have to say, I was actually taking this the class where I read your book. It was actually during the 2016 election. And oh, wow. we had we were living this. We were reading these books as, you know, live in this political moment. And I was scared out of my mind, like being in the research, knowing the research, like I was scared out of my mind because I was just like, this is real, y'all. And it's like people not understanding, like, whoa, this stuff has consequences. Woo. I, mm -hmm. I completely agree. Ooh, I, I can't <laughs> yes, wait to read that paper. Yeah, no, we, we really know. And so, yeah, there's so much that's going on right now. I mean, like, like if you don't mind me saying this, like, so I was one of the very few people that, that got it right when it came to Trump. And like, you know, and nobody ever really talks to me about this. Right. So I'm basically whenever I give a talk, I'm doing my <laughs> I told you so tour because I fucking told you guys. Right. Right. I told you guys I was on History Channel saying this. I've been in the newspaper saying this. And so there was a story last year about this time last year, the Seattle Times reporter. I live in Seattle, of course. And he interviewed me like on the eve of the election. He said, who do you think is going to win? I was like, Trump. He thought I was crazy. Right. And so then he comes back to me six months later and said, you were right. Right. How come nobody ever comes and talks to you about this? I want to give you credit. You know, I said, I got two words for you. I'm black. That's mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. nobody wants to talk to me about this stuff because I'm not I'm, I'm not sugarcoating this. And, you know, and like I said in the piece, the original piece and it right on the eve of the election, he said, why do you think Trump's going to win? I said, never underestimate the effect of scared mm -hmm. white people. Mm -hmm. Period. No, there's truth to that for sure. So for our listeners. Right. What? We know that Trump, when he speaks to his constituents, he's speaking to a particular set of folk. And then many probably would argue that yeah. it would be a lot of these reactionary conservatives. So what yeah. in Trump's language or in his policies, can you give us some examples for our listeners? So when if they're hearing him speak, they have a better idea of saying, oh, hey, he's talking he's talking to those folks and we should watch out. What's some of the things he may say? Well, I mean, any I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? Like what mm -hmm. he's saying is like, it's like, I mean, for us, let's let's keep it real. As people of color, you know, we listen for certain cues, and we can, and we're really astute at watching body language. And so, when he's talking about crime, when he's talking about um, law and order, right? But but that's not what Trump does. I mean, that that's what Republicans did back in the day. He doesn't need to do that now. He comes straight out and says mm. it. So so it's not going to be a mystery, mm -hmm. um, you know, to to your listeners about, you know, if he's saying anything that's racist. Right. I mean, he, he does this stuff all the time. Right. So it's not it's, it's no mystery. We can get on with the next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, you know, what? I actually think that's what was so surprising to me about Trump is that he would just say things that were just like blatantly 
races and you would think would have counted him out very early, but that's what scared me. It was like, oh wait, none of this yeah. stuff is knocking no, him out of the race. Bad. Okay, but think about think, think, think about it like this. Yeah. Now, before Obama, if if a politician said something like this, oh man, he they would have got drummed out. But after Obama and all, you know, you got all these scared white people. Then no, it's not going to hurt because they're already scared. Look, Trump represents. You know what? The reason why he gets away with so much of his bullshit is because. They see him as the last thing standing between them and the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's their champion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you said, he's their great white hope. He is is their (laughs) champion. Now, remember, however, like what Matt and I have, what Matt and I show in the new book, at the very end of the introduction, we talk about the, we discuss the, uh, the origins of the title of the book, The Great White Hope, and we reference the Tony Award winning play. And then, of course, you had the movie with James Earl Jones in it that followed. But ultimately, what happened was you had they had to find this great white because you had Jack Johnson that was just knocking white men out all over the place. Mm-hmm. Right. And it was just fucking with their masculinity. Right. He was dating white women and knocking them out, knocking white men out. <laughs> so, so that was just, I mean, seriously, it's like, no, it's seriously. I mean, that, that that's kind of what happens now. I mean, just like. You know, it's like the, I ain't even gonna go there. But Jack Johnson was knocking white <laughs> men out and hanging out and sleeping with their women, right? So that was like really in their heads. So they needed to find a great white hope to mm-hmm. to retain their masculinity. And guess what happened to that great white hope? He got knocked the fuck out. So so this so hopefully so, <laughs> so the only way they could stop Jack Johnson was to throw him in jail, mm-hmm. right? So, mm. so I'm hoping, yeah. you know, it's the same with us, right? White folks had to get this great white hope to keep all of us down and hopefully collectively we can rise up and knock him the fuck out. Mm. Mm. So actually speaking about that, like us coming collectively together. Um, so the last election did trust us or tell us not to trust polls. So we can't always trust polls. But uh, we have to ask you this anyway, because the polls were saying this a couple of weeks ago when Kanye was going on his rants about how. <laughs> do we really have to talk about? Do we really have to talk about Kanye? Okay, so yeah. it's really not talking about Kanye. It is. Okay. It okay. is talking about the boost in support among black men following that controversy, and it's just kind of like, what do you think of that? Like, should should we be afraid? Like. What? Uh, the, black, the, the, the boost to Trump, you mean? Among black men. So it went from like 11% to like 22%. Like, are there like black people in like there, this reactionary there, there, No, there, No, there are. There are, just like you had black people that supported the Tea Party. Right? And so that, that could be up for any number of reasons, one of which could be for religious reasons, right? As Terrell pointed out earlier. Mm-hmm. Another, another of which could be there's some black people that don't like black people. True, true. So, it's like it's it's this is just like that. You know how some of these people are. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to be confused with being black. Think about this. Think about this guy. I forgot this guy's name. He's on CNN. What's his name? Um, little little video guy who's a who used to work for Bush. Mm. Um, you guys are little video guy. Who t- I know who you're talking about. Okay, okay. I, Paris? Yeah, him. Paris Denard and uh oh and Ron Christie. <laughs> that motherfucker. Oh my god. I'm like, I'm like, y'all, you guys want to see what an Uncle Tom looks like? I showed this to my class. There you go, right there. <laughs> right. So, so this is what an Uncle Tom looks like. We both have the same skin, but oh, we ain't the same guy. So, so 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 yeah, you got some of those kind of black people, right? who still think we have something to prove in order to be first-class citizens, right? You have those kind of black folks that are still left, right? And so, and I, I can't explain, honestly, I really wish I could explain, you know, why, well, I could, I, I do have an idea about why some black men, you know, like support Kanye, who came out for Trump behind Kanye's uh, support, but I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say it on air. So I'm not going to ask you off there, though. You can ask me off air. I'm not going to say it on air. Uh, I I have some ideas about why that's the case. But um, but I but there are. But just to answer your more basic question, there are some black people that don't like black people. They didn't like Obama. 
right? Mm-hmm. They 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 just they're just like you guys ever watch um the Boondocks? Yep. Mm-hmm. The, these are Uncle Ruckus kind of people. Do I need yeah. to say any more? Mm-hmm. Nope. Get it all the way. <laughs> got, got it all the way. <laughs> oh, uh, so getting to our last couple of questions with this one, um, you know, in recent news, there has been a lot of coverage following the NFL's decision talking about protests and freedom of speech or what have you. And there have yeah. been many conversations about patriotism. So what brand of patriotism does the reactionary right kind of subscribe to? And are there any implications for marginalized populations because of this? Ooh, that's another good question. That's another kind of branch of my research. Um, I'm working on something else on that right now. You know what? Those people on the right, they're not patriots at all. They're nationalists. They're not fucking patriots. Hmm. So let me let me explain the difference between the two. So a patriot is about a, a patriot is someone who has a commitment to the values on which their country was founded. Right. A commitment so strong that they're willing to die if necessary in order to maintain that commitment. Right. Um, And so and so and so when you think about the values on which this country was was based now, now we all know that they didn't really apply to people of color and women from Jump Street. We know that. And it's debate about right now whether or not they apply. But this country was founded on essentially progressive values, tolerance, egalitarianism. And freedom, but I say freedom tentatively. Let me tell you why I say freedom tentatively, tentatively, because white people tend to look at freedom differently than people of color. White people see freedom as freedom from government interference. We see freedom as freedom from discrimination. So 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 you have those values. Right. And so if you think about applying those values and you think about guarding those values zealously, and if you think about being having such fidelity to these values that you're willing to die for them. Right. Then that we should see a more progressive society. We wouldn't be seeing what we're seeing now from patriots. Real patriots would see what Colin Kaepernick and those other guys that were kneeling. Right. They would see that as patriotic because freedom of speech is part of one of our core values. Right. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's part of this value of freedom. Right. They would see it as such and they would guard that zealously. I was in the military myself. Right. And I'm telling you, that is part of what we fought for. Right. It's for people to have the freedom to say that even if you have an idiot Ku Klux Klan member who wants to march down Main Street, if that's what he wants to do, then let him do it. Let him do it. Right. It's about freedom of speech. So then he can reveal to a lot of other people that he's a fucking idiot bigot. Right. That's fine with me. I don't care. Right. Let me tell you guys something else. When I was interviewing when I was interviewing veterans for my first book, I interviewed this guy. He was he served in the Korean War. He, he, he had come back to Arkansas on, on leave and he was using a, a quote unquote white restroom in Arkansas and a white man walked in. He, he will never forget this. He said, Chris, he had a short sleeve white shirt on with a red top. And he said he walked up to me, looked at me because my man was in uniform. He says, just because you niggas wear a uniform, you think you're as good as a white man. Y'all still ain't shit. And you know what he said? He said, Chris. I wanted to kill that white man. But you know what? I fought for him to have the right to say that. So, mm. I, so I'm telling you. So so patriot, that's what patriotism is. It's about a commitment to a set of, in this case, progressive values. That's not what nationalism is. Nationalism is my country right or wrong. Nationalism is, is blindly following the dictates of whoever is in office, right, without critically thinking about them. Right. To be a patriot, you, you love your country so much you're willing to criticize it. You want to make your country, the social practices, uh, you want them to be in alignment with the values on which the country was founded. When this country starts veering away from those values, a patriot will criticize it to try to correct it. That's not what a nationalist will do. A nationalist is committed to a certain group of people, not values. Right. A nationalist believe that their their group organized on the basis of language, uh, common history, ethnicity. They believe their group or in culture, they believe their group is better than other groups. That's what we're seeing right now. So that is not patriotism. That is nationalism. And it's white nationalism on top of that. Mm. So, I mean, I think you did a really good job of like describing what patriotism is and like even like healthy like I am going to stand up for these principles regardless of who 
might be the person uh, that's, you know, benefiting from my Mm self-sacrifice. And so in, in thinking about that and thinking about your discussion of like the potential great white hope trajectory, um, thinking about like this current nationalist sentiment, I guess, what are your predictions? Where, where, where do you see us going? Um, where do you see the trajectory and like, how do we, how do we, how do we continue to move forward instead of letting them take things back? Well, I think that, I think the first step is, uh, people who are more progressive in thought is about triage. You got to stop the bleeding and stopping the bleeding consists of having a, having a consistent message. It can't be, what's going to happen is if you get a Bernie kind of candidate, whether it's Bernie or whether it's Elizabeth Warren coming out and saying it's about class and it's about the middle class and working class whites, Bozo the Clown is going to fucking win again because the Democrats are going to be split. You're going to have people that are about the race stuff and about the and about the feminist stuff and and i'm clear about race and feminism i'm not saying white women because i don't trust white women to do the right thing (laughs) right i mean think think about it like this so so doug even doug jones in alabama won 53 percent of college educated white women did y'all hear me? Fifty three percent of college educated white women, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I think, and I think Hillary, I think Hillary among women, I forget what the educational breakdown was, but I know among all women, I think Hillary beat Trump by maybe two percentage points, right? White women by two percentage points. White women, I want to stress that. So, 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 I just so so that's why I'm that, so I don't want to count on white women. I'll count on. Feminists, right? White feminists, right? They'll come out against Trump, um, but not. I'm not counting on white women to do the right thing. Um, we know black women and women of color are going to come out and do the right thing. We know that, right? So, so I think that I think that one of the things we have to do on the left is get a coherent message, and it can't be about this Bernie bro class politics bullshit. Not going to fucking work, right? It needs to be about identity. I know people don't want to go there. And I know that's not what they want because it's not the right thing, right? But forget about the right thing. We need to be more pragmatic about that. We don't have the we don't have the latitude. We don't have the luxury to be idealists right now, right? We have to be more practical. And so, sort of painting Trump as someone who's trying to turn back the clock, uh, not only on racial progress but on femininity, right, or on women's rights, on feminism, right? That it, it might be a narrow win, but it'll be a win nonetheless. And I think the more that the more that these Republicans, you know, try to tie themselves to Trump or Democrats can successfully tie them to Trump, the more likely uh, the Dems are going to are going to win. Like, I like Stacey Abrams chances. I mean, look at what Stacey Abrams is doing in Georgia. She's like, we ain't going after no none of these moderate or working class whites. Right. That's not what they did. And they won. They won the nomination. Right. So it needs to be more of that. Right. More of that, more of what happened in Alabama, more of what happened in Virginia. Forget about this working class white bullshit. It's like it's not it's not like I don't have any sympathy for him, but I'm going to keep this real. I mean, it's like, look, 67 percent of working class whites voted for Trump. They ain't coming back. Right. And like I said, mm-hmm. white people, last time I checked, like this for the rest of my life. Right. And before that, you know, they weren't the only people that were working class and that are working class. So, mm-hmm. so, so, so later for that stuff, this is going to be about race. This is going to be about uh, feminism. And this is going to be about, look, this guy is trying to turn back the clock. Right. I mean, think about, have you guys seen or read Margaret Atwood stuff? Um, uh, the, the Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that is scary. So, so the it second is. season is more and more about the slippery slope and how they got there. And we're on a slippery slope because this guy just does so much dumb shit Right. We get desensitized to it. Right. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, what did he say today? Right. And we get so desensitized to it that the stuff he does, that would be a controversy or be a scandal for anybody else. It's just like another blip. Right. It's like a it's it's like a bump in the road. And and that's what is so scary about this guy. Right. Because we're on a slippery slope right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, well, I appreciate this. I feel energized. And informed. Oh, oh, oh! Can I, can I can I can I interrupt you? I'm sorry. Just go ahead. Two no, other, go two ahead. Points I want to add, you guys. I'm sorry for interrupting. Two other no, points no, I want to add, and this is what Matt and I bring up in the book. If you change the turnout for people of color, 
by 0.78 percentage points, Hillary Clinton wins Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Mm. Not even a whole percentage point. Not even a whole percentage point, right? So Mm -hmm. we can be key in this. And the second thing is, another thing we show is that the more people of color are concerned about the existential threat that is associated with Trump, the more likely we are to form interracial political coalitions. Mm. So this is important stuff, you guys. Yeah. Okay, so what I have learned today is I'm I'm about to scare some folk. I, I'm just going <laughs> to hammer it in. I'm going to make everybody feel threatened because I felt threatened. Like, mm-hmm. I'm still scared about this whole Supreme Court thing and mm-hmm. what might happen and what this is yeah. going to mean for my kids and grandkids. Mm-hmm. And so I I feel you, and I feel like you have a really good strategy, and we're just going to have to hammer this in because something got to change. Oh, we yeah. can't do this. No, we no we can't. But 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 one of the good things, so, but let's think, but I also want to leave you with this. This is a, this is a real chance for this country to really, sort of live up to its values. So I tend to look at this, unlike most people, as glass half full. And I look at it as glass half full because one can no longer deny this is a racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic place. You can't deny it anymore. There's no more plausible deniability. So basically, Mm -hmm. Americans, we have to shit or get off the pot. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like that simple. It's that simple, you guys. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Is there anywhere people can find you? Any social media, things like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks for that? asking. I'm still kind of new to this game. So, <laughs> I, so, so, so I have to add, okay, so my handle was at Black Bruin, and it's, it's Black Bruin because I guess hopefully you can tell by the base of my voice, I'm a black man, and I graduated from UCLA. <laughs> so, yeah, real simple. Black At Black Bruin. Nice. Okay. All right, we'll, and we'll be sure to add that on the uh when we post this as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we'll link any popular media articles about your work and, and how people can link to get this book. Cause when I tell y'all this book is, it's amazing. It, mm-hmm. it is amazing. You want to read it. And I'm not just saying that because we are interviewing him. Like gener- this is, I've been in graduate school for a long time and this is one of the best books I've read in graduate school. And I mean that well, I don't lie to y'all. Well, well I, 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 I mean, you could have, you could have said the best book, but that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> you, you, you kind of gotta. I, 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 I can't think of another book I would place in that category right now. But you, you gotta leave room. You I gotta, know. You gotta, I know. I'm just giving. You gotta leave you room. Gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep them humble. Is what you're trying to say. I'm just, I'm just giving you a hard time. But, but you know what makes me feel better, Daphne, is that you said you've been in graduate school a long time, and this is one of the best books. So you've read many, many, many books. So. Oh Thanks. yeah, this is year. This is year. I'm coming up on year eight. Okay. Hey, Lee. So yeah. Hey, hey, that, hey, that, that's okay. It's about finishing. It's about how you finish. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I have read a lot of books, y'all. <laughs> I have, <laughs> and I mean it. I mean it. Uh, <laughs> hey, funny. well, next time you all see Larry, tell Larry I said what's up. I will. Okay. Definitely. So Daph, that was. That was awesome. <laughs> that was lit or litty, as some people <laughs> might say. It was a, a, li- a lituation. <laughs> Child, I, you know what? He kept it so real. Um, and I just appreciate that to like hear this tenure professor. And I mean, he has that freedom a little bit because he has tenure. But to just speak so real and like speak a language and speak in a way that I think will really connect to uh, quite a few of our audience members, especially as it comes, as it relates to politics um, and, and the messages that we receive. So, yes, Dr. Parker. Yes. have me. Like look- I said in the interview, preach. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Got me looking forward to getting tenure, man. Like, woo, is this what freedom feels like? <laughs> is that what I get to say now? <laughs> is that what freedom feels like? Oh, man. But I mean, he was, you know passionate definitely you know just felt energized after the conversation had a lot of great points about you know just reactionary reactionary conservatism and politics in general 
you know, I'm gonna have to hit him up again and ask him, uh, cause you know how he was like, oh, I have to say that offline when I was like, why, you know, some black man might be supporting or like increasing support for Trump now. Oh, I, I'm gonna yeah. have to hit him up and uh, hear that offline. Yeah, you're gonna get that um, tea. <laughs> yes, feel that tea. Uh, another thing is he brought it, he raised some interesting points and I, I wanna hear what you think about like what he called Bernie bro bs yeah <laughs> uh and so i you know i as someone who is progressive and you know on the more liberal side like i of course would support bernie sanders if he was the candidate but what dr parker or chris mm -hmm. uh said about like bernie sanders and even potentially the the coded language that he uses that is almost exclusionary of black working class people mm -hmm. kind of rang true to me that like i can see that and I, i've definitely picked up those cues before to where when bernie is talking about the people that were left out by the democratic party when you know they lost the election in 2016 i didn't necessarily get that he was talking about me or my mom or my dad who have been working class and working their whole life mm -hmm. uh I didn't necessarily get the feeling that they were included in Bernie Sanders' definition of like this working class that Democrats forgot. Yeah, that point he made was very enlightening. Um, I think the fact that he did say, you know, was, you know, there are working class black folk, and I think that gets missed in the language. And I also think that sometimes, just as black folk, we get swept up in the the passion and the emotions of the moment. Um, and I think, you know, whether people were for Hillary or whether people were for, for Bernie, I think we need to start being a little bit more particular as far as who we support and making sure mm -hmm. that even with Hillary, it was like over time, it took time for her to talk about race on her agenda, you know, on her platform. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like something from from jump and Bernie mentioning it every now and then. But yeah, he was talking for more of a a class issue and economics and really not addressing race specifically. Um, and so I think we need to pay attention to that uh, whenever this next, you know, in 2020, but also pay attention to 2018. Um, it's important because I think we need to do a better job as a community of just making, holding people accountable and be like, yeah, this, this mm -hmm. sounds nice, Bernie, but you ain't saying nothing about us specifically or Hillary, you ain't saying nothing about us specifically. And I mean, it just sucks because of the two party system. We always give our loyalties to the Democrats, um, you know, lesser two evils, whatever. But I just feel like we need to figure out something else. And I wouldn't be opposed to looking closely at somebody who's independent or somebody else who just really, you know, talking for us and helping us out and giving us a voice because Trump, gave all middle America a voice, you know, and they have somebody there representing them. So it can happen for us, you know, who we can have a candidate mm -hmm. that is maybe primarily just for us, whether that's wrong or right, doesn't matter, but it's possible. And we've seen that in the past. So mm -hmm. I think we need to stop thinking like, oh, we'll never see anybody that's all the way for us. But I think if we put the right candidate up, and so, I think we can do it, you know? Yeah, I definitely agree. And like I've said before, I am not going to like chastise anybody who went out and voted with their heart, you know, you know, even if that was third party or whatever. I mean, I might have some <laughs> feelings about it, but, you know, at least you voted. Uh, but what I will say and will continue to say, and I've probably said before, is that you don't wait until the national election year to decide that you want to burn mm -hmm. down the house. You get what I'm saying? Like it was just too much at stake. And I appreciated somebody like Chris, who he is an expert in this thing has examined, you know, these issues using quantitative methods, qualitative mm -hmm. methods. He knows it. You don't wait. There are too many things at stake, like the Supreme Court, the all of these things. And I think that's just what pissed me off so much about people that was just like, oh, I'm not going to vote or, you know, whatever. It's just kind of like, dude, if you are trying to keep the opportunities that we have and make sure your children have opportunities Boo, you can't just be throwing away votes. And like, I'm going I'm to start, I'm going to start getting on that scare folk tip. Like, oh, they're going to take us back. 
Because, I mean, fear is what clearly works. It, it worked to get Trump in office, and maybe that fear can, like, motivate some people to be like, okay, yeah, we got to get Trump up out of here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think for me, too, I think uh, we'll do an episode on this, too, but before maybe when it gets closer to voting. But I think looking at the history of voting for black folk in America, uh, I think we need to highlight that because that also just – serves as motivation is why we need to vote and take it seriously when you know you hear the stories of people dying to go vote people getting lynched Mm -hmm. to go vote Mm -hmm. knowing that they were going to probably die and risking their life to cast this vote um and we just take it lightly and we shouldn't you know the people our predecessors have lost their lives to give us this right and i think you know we need to exercise that power because they did it for a reason Right. They get they did it because they understand the impact and the power of it. And it's not just like this thing you can just look overlook and, then you know, say, oh, I'll do it. No, we no, no, we can't do that. We got to do better than that. And, um, you know, we just got to educate our folks a little bit more on that. Yeah, I think a key thing that also just keeps coming up in all of our interviews is the importance of local politics. Mm-hmm. Get involved at the local level from your school board to your prosecutors, to your judges, to, you know, anybody that you can elect that actually has an impact on your daily life. You have to take these things seriously and you can't just look at like the president or the national scene to wonder why things are not happening right in your life. Yeah, yeah. Like make sure you are electing the right people on the local level who actually make these decisions on like, you know, economics and commerce and development at the local level. Like, you know, come on y'all. Yeah. The reality is federal level does not really touch down on the local level, right? If you're complaining about, you know, certain things or the budget for your school system or potholes in the street, <laughs> whatever it is, President ain't fixing that. You know? <laughs> not to, president cannot fix that. He's not worried about that, that kind of stuff. But your local congressmen, your local states people, whoever it is, um, they're the ones that can make immediate change mm-hmm. right in your neighborhood, right in your block, right in your kid's school. Um, so I think, you know, we have to begin taking that a lot more seriously, too. And then once you build the momentum locally, then it's it, it spirals, it grows into the, the bigger picture of things mm-hmm. once you gain more support and traction. Mm-hmm. So in thinking about like the growth of the Tea Party and how, you know, that's how they started at the local level. You know, they started, oh, let's infiltrate Congress. Let's infiltrate mm-hmm. like all of these things. And then they had enough people to where, OK, at the more national level, they can make these huge impacts that can make make it to where Trump can do whatever the heck he wants to do. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. they, I, I mean, I have to give it to them. They were really smart. Hey, <laughs> they played, they played that game. Good. They, they played, played chess. And they got that whole country looking chess, like. Not checkers. Yeah. <laughs> they were, they playing the long game and they waited the eight years while Obama was in, they was plotting and they was planning and they succeeded. Mm-hmm. And we all woke up, you know, from the dream of Obama to this nightmare now. Yeah. And I would say that the thing about voting in local elections is it's easier to create change because so few people actually vote in them. So, like, mm-hmm. if you can just get like a contingency together, like y'all can really do something. So that's that's yeah. my advice. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, I also like what Chris talked about when, when we kind of talked about or addressed the uh, football situation with the NFL and kneeling and, and difference between. Uh, What is patriotism? What does that look like? And he made Mm -hmm. the distinction, you know, patriotism versus nationalism. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a major distinction there. And and a lot of what we're seeing is nationalism and Mm -hmm. patriotism is something that's completely different. Patriotism allows you to have the flexibility to critique your country because you want it to be better Um, and not living with this. Like my country is the greatest and nothing needs to be changed and it's perfect and all this other kind of stuff. So, you know, it, it's dropped a lot of gems in that interview. And definitely I feel like in a language that everyone can understand, which is one of the things mm-hmm. I appreciate most about it for sure. Speaking of that, it's actually interesting because Trump, uh, 
also said that he did not agree with uh, the players being able to sit in the locker room uh, Mm -hmm. during the anthem and that, you know, if they don't want to be out there standing during the anthem, then they don't need to be playing. Mm -hmm. And speaking of like what Chris said, there's this quote that forced patriotism is fascism. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like you cannot force people to be patriotic. That's not why we so-called live in the land of the free. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that's a, it's a scary situation, man. This NFL situation and what's going on. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how it all plays out. But we need to keep our eyes open. We need to stay woke, folk. We need to stay, stay woke. woke. <laughs> and keep at least one eye open. Keep at least one eye, one eye open, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! But no, but we appreciate um, Dr. Parker taking out the time to come talk to us. Very, very, very busy person. Uh, but we Very always busy. appreciate it. Yeah, when they when they come and drop these gems for us. Um, and as always, continue to follow us on social media at BHD Podcast. Visit our website, www.blackandhollydangerous.com. Email us uh, uh, at bhdpodcast at gmail.com. Continue to rate and review, rate and review, rate and review, rate and review on iTunes. And um, hit us up. Ideas, topics, questions, anything, emails, saying hello. We appreciate it all. Uh, and other than that, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.